Welcome again to Camp Hope Abbey Church, located 114 Camp Hope Church Road, Macon, Georgia, 31211. Amen. Another Wednesday to study to show our self-approval. Workmen need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to be talking about Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. And again, I got a couple of emails, amen, saying, why do you go line by line, precept by precept? The story is important. Understanding uh, how the beginnings are important. Foundationals are important, amen. When Jesus came, Jesus came and fulfilled the, the prophetic words, amen, fulfill all the laws, fulfill all the things. So it's good to know what Jesus has done for us. And we can't know unless we know the history line by line, precept by precept, and understand what was going on and why it was done. I'd like to thank all those that's joining us out here today and has always been joining us, those that might even click on it and, and then just go through it. We thank God for you as well. We thank God for our virtual members. We thank God for our our covenant members, we thank God for our friends, all of you out there in the virtual world. We just thank you for tuning in with us, and we thank you for supporting us. We cannot do this without you. We thank you for all that you do, all that you have allowed us to, to use your resources that God has blessed you and blessed you to help us, and we have shown you that whatever you give us and whatever you designate to us, that is what it is used for. So we just want to thank you. We want to bless you. We ask God to just bless each and every one of you tenfold, a hundredfold, even a thousandfold as you support the ministry that God has given here at Camp Hope AME Church in Macon, Georgia. And of course, our motto is to each and every one that says, come and grow with us as we transform our thoughts, our words, and our deeds as we prepare for Christ's return. Amen. Amen. Now let's move on with our study. Amen. Get your Bibles out again. It's Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Amen. Allow me to go into prayer while uh, you get your Bibles out. God, we just thank you. We praise you. We glorify you for you are truly worthy. We praise. Thank you for being you. Thank you for allowing us to be able to come out and study with the world. Thank you for allowing us to grow. Thank you for allowing us to have ministry. Thank you for giving us vision, purpose, mission. Thank you for, you for giving us the resources, the help, the mind, the wisdom, the understanding that we can make the vision plain, that people might understand that they would join in the vision, the mission, and the purpose find their place and work towards what you would have us to work towards, Lord. Going out and making disciples, Lord, and, and running this world, this a kingdom that's in the world and not of the world, waiting for your return. And Lord, if we've done anything in thought, word, and deed that would hinder you from giving, coming, we ask forgiveness right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, we ask that you just bless Camp Hope, bless each and every one of its ministries, bless each and every one that's supporting us and joining us that is covered by us, Lord. And Lord, mostly allow the Holy Spirit to come and teach in accuracy and bring back to remembrance those things that we need to understand. Give us revelations, give us wisdom, give us all we need that we might be a light, not for ourselves, but for you, Lord, and that will strengthen us and remind us as we make our decisions, as we go forth and do things, as we hear things, that we might know that you are the author, the finisher of our faith. You are the blessed, the creator that brought us thus far, and you are who we are to witness concerning the kingdom of God. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. This is our prayer we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and thank God. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 22, we pray you have your Bibles out there. Let's read. I'll be reading the NIV version. If you see your fellow Israelite ox or sheep straying, do not ignore it, but be sure to take it back to its owner. If they do not live near you or if you do not know 
who owns it, take it home with you and keep it until they come looking for it. Then give it back. Do the same if you find their donkey, a clog, or anything else that they, that they have lost. Do not ignore it. If you see your fellow Israelite donkeys or ox fallen on the road, do not ignore it. Help the owner get it to its feet. A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear woman's clothing. For the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. If you come across a bird's nest besides the road, either in a tree or on, a, on the ground, and the mother is sitting on the young or on the eggs, do not take the mother at, with the young. You may take the young, but be sure to let the mother go so that it may go well with you and you may have a long life. When you build a new house and make a, a parapet around your roof so that you may not bring the guilt of bloodshed on your house if someone falls from the roof. Do not plant two kinds of seeds in your vineyard. If you do, not only the crops you plant, but also the fruit of the vineyard will be defiled. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Do not wear clothes of wool and linen woven together. Make tassels on the four corners of the clog, clog, cloak, excuse me, cloak you wear. If a man takes a wife and are sleeping with her, dislike her and slander her and give her a bad name, saying, I married this woman, but when I approached her, I did not find proof of her virginity, then the young woman's father and mother shall bring to the town elders at the gate proof that she was a virgin. Her father will say to the elders, I gave my daughter in marriage to this man, but he dislikes her. Now he has slandered her and said, I did not find your daughter to be a virgin, but here is the proof of my daughter's virginity. Then her parents shall display the cloth before the elders of the town, and the elders shall take the man and punish him. They shall find him a hundred shekels of silver and give him them to the young woman's father, because this man has given an Israelite virgin a bad name. She shall continue to be his wife. He must not divorce her as long as he lives. If, however, the charge is true and no proof of the young woman's virgin can be found, virginity can be found, she shall be brought to the door of her father's house and there the men of the town shall stone her to death. She has done an outrageous thing in Israel by being promiscuous while still in her father's house. You must purge the evil from among you. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. If a man happens to meet in a town of virgin, pledged to be married, and he sleeps with her, you shall take both of them to the gate of the town and stone them to death. The woman, the young woman, because she was in a town and did not scream for help, and the man because he violated another man's wife. You must purge the evil from among you. But if out in the country a man happens to be the young woman pledged to be married and rapes her, only the man who has done this shall die. Do not, excuse me, do nothing to the woman. She has committed no sin deserving death. This case is like that of someone who attacks and murders a neighbor. For the man found the young woman out in the country, and though the betrothed betroth woman screamed, there was no one to rescue her. If a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and rapes her and they are discovered, he shall pray 
her father's, she shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver. He must marry the young woman for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives. A man is not to marry his father's wife for he, for must, excuse me, he must not dishonor his father's bed. I read for you Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 1 through 30. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be done to God. Amen. Let's get right into it. Let's get right into it. Amen. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Verses 1 through 4 talks about uh, the kindness uh, to your brother regarding his animals. Talked about uh, the oxen, the sheep, the, the, the donkey, all of these things. It was talking. God has uh, condemned the sin of doing nothing. To see your brother in need and do to do nothing, it is, it is to do evil if you don't help them. When one has the opportunity to do good, you must not hide yourself. You see it, you see it has happened, you need to give a hand in whatever it's doing. Simply put, when something is lost, a finder cannot claim it as theirs without taking a due diligence to restore it to its owner. If the owner seeks the missing object, it must be restored to him. Plain and simple. If we go back in Exodus chapter 23, verses 4 and 5, uh, it commands Israel to also help stray animals, but extend this obligation to stray animals even from their enemies, not just their brothers, not just their neighbors, even their enemies. Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Um, also, if someone's donkey falls down and you cannot and you can help them, then you must help them get them back on their feet. To pass by your brother in need and to hide yourself from them is to sin against your brother, and also it is to sin against God. Verse 5 talks about uh, a command to keep a uh, distinction between the sexes as far as clothing is concerned. Of course, in the Old Testament, men and women were uh, wore clothing that were superficially similar. Uh, long robes and, and, and wrapping garments um, were common for both sex. Yet the specific type of garment and the way in which they were worn made a clear distinction between the sexes. And this command instructs in, uh, this command instructs God's people to respect those distinctions. Don't wear it like a man wear it, like a woman wear it, because back then it was similar, similar clothing. Some has taken this command to be proof, uh, to be the proof text against women wearing pants, and some Christian groups command that women wear only dresses. Yet this is not a command against women wearing a garment in some way, in that way. In some ways, it might be common between men and women. It is a command against dressing in a manner which deliberately blurs the lines between the sexes. Hear me. Uh, also, this does not prohibit a man from wearing a, a, a kilt, because back then they were kilt. It, it, yet it clearly permits a man dressing like a woman as it all it is all too common and all too acceptable of course in in our time now then it goes on and it tells us uh this command to observe the distinction between the sexes is so important those who fail to observe <laughs> Those who fail to observe it are called an abomination to the Lord. One reason was because, and listen to me now, cross-dressing was a feature of paganism, idolatry worship in the ancient world. And they just didn't want to be seen as, as, as them 
being a part of their worship towards paganism, idolatry worship. That's where all this came about. Uh, later, uh, we had a, 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 a writers such as uh, Lucan and Sama Aseda and Eusebius um, uh, speak of the practice of, of, of masquerading in the worship of a, a particular god. I think the god was Astere, A-S-T-A-R-T-E. Apparently, women appeared in men's garments and men in women's garments doing that particular, uh, worshiping that particular idol. So that was one main, main and more powerful reason because God wanted to distinguish the practices between uh, worshiping him and them worshiping their gods, all right? Verses six through seven talked about a command to show kindness to animals, period. God simply and plainly commanded kindness to animals, even a bird's nest, was to be given special consideration and care. Some Jewish uh, uh, commentators say that this is the smallest and least of all the commandments, yet even it had a promise of blessings for the obedience attached to it, that it may be well, it says, with you, and that you may prolong your days. If Israel would obey this command, they would find blessings and long life, both as individuals and not only that, but also as a nation. What possible connection can there be between showing kindness to birds' nests and eggs and little baby birds and, 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 and national survivors, survival, one might ask? Well, first, because Obedience to the smallest of God's command brings blessings, as we as we read. It puts us into a proper submission, uh, submissive relationship to God. That this all and it always brings blessings unto us, where we are in proper relationship with our God. And secondly, uh, because kindness and gentleness in the smallest often but not always speaks to our ability to be kind and gentle in, in weighted or matters. If someone is cruel to animals, not only is that sin in itself, but they are also much more likely to be cruel to people. If Israel allowed such cruelty to flourish, it would harm the nation as a whole. Verses um, Eight uh, talks about liability and uh, uh, building code. Uh, talks about the roof. God commanded that a, a railing be made for uh, the rooftop so someone was protected against falling if they had to go up there for one reason or another. And God goes on and says failure to, to build in a safe way would bring guilt, liability on the owner or builder of the home. They were responsible for the safety of those who would use their homes. So God had respect of everyone, even the visitors, even those that may be working about your particular home, their particular home but down at that time. Verses 9 through uh, 12 is, full, uh, is the four laws of separation. Four laws of separation. Then it talks about uh, you shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seeds. Um, each of these laws uh, was meant to separate Israel from uh, her pagan neighbors. That's what you, you need to realize. Who would commonly combine unlike things to achieve what, would, what was thought to be a magical combination. God, no. God said, I'll give the increase. You don't need to do such a thing. Uh, so in the pagan culture, it was common to combine different kinds of seeds in a vineyard or to plow with an ox and a donkey. God said, don't do those two. Or to wear a garment of wool and linen. God says, don't do that uh, together. Uh, when God commanded Israel to not to do these things, it isn't so much 
for the sake of the combination themselves, uh, but so that Israel would not imitate the pagan occult customs of their neighbors. That's what we're talking about here. Let us not get things twisted and use things out of context. Uh, there is a spiritual application of this principle. The command forbidding unholy combinations, though it in itself small and trivial, are given to forbid all mixtures of their intention with God, institution, in doctrine and worship. Remember, do do doctrine and worship. One commentator believed that these laws were also given in part to protect uh, other animals from the bad uh, breath of donkeys. <laughs> besides the donkey feed uh, from uh, besides the donkey from feeding on coarse and poisonous weeds has a has a uh, fetal uh, breath, which its yoke fellow seek. Uh, to avoid, not only as a poisonous or offensive, but producing uh, leanness or if long, continuous death. So it was to protect the health, the health of the particular animal as well. And it says, goes on, you shall um, um, put tassels on the bottom of your of your clothing, on the corners of your clothing. This command was also to distinguish the Israelites from their pagan neighbors. In a way, an Israelite a man uh, uh, in the in this way, an Israelite man was immediately known by the clothing that he wore. Once you saw that tassel, you were recognized and know that you were an Israelite. And a, and a symbolic meaning is given to these tassels. If we go back and read Numbers chapter 15, 37 through 47, mainly that, and it was mainly that it was a way of remembering uh, or a reminder to Israel to keep God's commandments, to keep God's commandments. Remember, all these laws are not necessary to make life hard, but to put us in a manner that we are positive with God, that we are not confused with our neighbor, that our neighbor we won't be confused with us and our practices and our beliefs, All right? Verses 13 through 21 talks about uh, the laws of, uh, of uh, sexual morality. Uh, matter of fact, 13 through 21 resolving an accusation of marital uh, deception. Uh, here in these scriptures, the idea is that the man accused his wife of not being a virgin when they were married. Apparently, this was discovered on their wedding night when they first had intimate relations. Because it's, it, the scripture says, when I came into her, I found that she was not a a virgin. It is important to understand that in ancient Israel, uh, virginity was uh, uh, was valued at that particular time. It was seen as a great loss to give up one's virginity before marriage. If a woman was known to have lost her virginity, it was greatly reduce. It would greatly reduce her chances of getting married. By the same principle, if a, if a husband believed that his wife had lied about her virginity, he 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 felt cheated. Uh, what follows is an attempt to resolve this particular issues in these scriptures. According to custom, a Jewish woman would first be intimate with her husband upon a special cloth, which would collect the small drops of blood which were accepted as evidence of the young woman's virginity. This bloodstained cloth would then uh, become the property of the married woman's parents who kept it as evidence of the use of uh, the young woman's uh, virginity, just in case uh, the husband came back and said, uh, accused her of something at that particular time. And during that 
that time, marriage was a little different. Um, ladies were given into marriage at 12 and even 13 years old in the, in the custom down there at that time. The custom is, is still practiced in some parts of the world. The proof of virginity of what we're talking about. The proofs of virginity, the blood spotted cloth or garments, which uh, though not infallible, were widely accepted in the ancient Near East as indication of prior virginity and are still accepted among some people today. Right? Now, if the husband would uh, accuse uh, his wife of not being a virginity, then the, the parents would get involved. Uh, if the parents could produce the evidence, then the man was found to have made false accusations against his wife, and it was commanded that a fine to be paid to the father of his bride, be 50 shekels. Additionally, the man had forfeited his future right to divorce his wife. He could not marry, he could not divorce her all the days of his life. This strong penalty against a man would, would was made. Uh, that man who, who who made a false accusation uh, also paid one hundred shekels uh, and lost of the right to to uh, divorce his wife uh, in the future. Uh, an effective deterrent against wild false accusations by a husband against his wife. So this was a deterrent, you know, deterrent. Now, if this were the case, the woman was not a virgin. She was not a virgin. Then the woman was to be executed by stoning. This was not only for her sexual promis promiscuity, but also for her attempt to deceive her husband. The law must be seen in connection with the command that we read earlier in Exodus 22, 16 and 17, which commands that a man who enticed a virgin must surely pay the bride's price for her to be his wife. Okay. More than heavy, but that's how it is. Verses 22. Verses 22 talks about the penalty for adultery. Um, God commanded the death penalty for adultery. Uh, this was primarily because of the excessively great social consequences of this sin. Therefore, God commanded the ultimate uh, penalty against it. Both of them, not just one of them, both of them must die. God also specifically instructed again, both the man that laid with the woman and the woman. Adultery was not to be con was not to be condemned with a double standard. If it was wrong for the woman, guess what? It was wrong for the man and, of course, vice versa in uh, the particular situation when it came uh, to adultery. The death penalty had value. It, com it communicated loudly and clearly an ideal that Israel was to live up to and it made people regard their sin much more seriously. Mercy. Something to think about. Then verses 23 to 29 talked about laws concerning uh, rape. If a man had an, a, a, an intimate relationship with a virgin who was betrothed to a husband, it and it happened in the city, now listen, and no one immediately heard the woman cry out in an attempt to stop the man then both of them were executed. The woman was to 
be executed for disgracing her virginity. The man was to be executed because he humbled his neighbor's wife. Interestingly, the woman was considered the wife of another man, even though she was only betrothed and was still a virgin, having not yet uh, consummated the marriage. However, but if a man finds a woman out in the countryside, if a man had intimate relationship with a virgin who was betrothed and it happened in a countryside where no one could hear the woman, even if she cried out, then only the man was to be executed because the woman was presumed to be the victim of rape. You see the difference? In a city where people are around, if it's happening, a woman screams out. If she doesn't scream out, that means she's consenting to it. See it? See the difference? If a man had intimate relationships and a woman in the countryside, then the man's going to be executed because the woman could scream and no one heard her. Significantly, the woman was not to be blamed for the rape, and it was presumed that she was innocent in this particular circumstance. If a man had intimate relationship with a virgin who is not betrothed now, then he must pay a fine and was obligated to marry that woman. And he forfeited his right to divorce her in the future. Something to think about. All right. Of course, the last verse 30 talks about incest, laws concerning incest. A man shall not take his father's wife. Now, this probably described the case of a son marrying his stepmother after his father had died. This was considered incest, even though there was no blood relationship, because he was considered to have had uncovered his father's bed at that particular time. Well, this is Deuteronomy chapter 22. I pray you would go back and read it again. Study it over, pray about it, let God speak to you. It's a lot in there. And I pray that we made it clear and understandable as we went through it. Amen. We know God loves us all. He sees us all. We're all equal in God's eyes. Amen. God has no preferential. We're all the same on the level of God. And God wants us all to have life and have it more abundantly. So let us continue to study to show ourselves approval. That way we can get the, the, the background. We can get the foundation. We can get what we need to understand, even some of the practices that people do today, amen, that may or may not have been covered through the blood of Jesus, amen. That's a subject, that's a, a discussion for another a study, amen. But at least we know the foundational things and why why they were put in place. And again, most of them were put in place because of idolatry, because of pagan worship and all of those things. So go back, read again, ask God to give you some revelations, ask God to give you some understanding of what was going on and why God put things in place. Again, as we always say in our motto, come grow with us as we transform our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, as we prepare for Christ's return. Know that we love you. We pray that you will continue supporting us. Remember, we cannot support. Do this without your support. So we thank each and every one of you in your giving, in your support. Amen. And know, and know that we love you with the love of Christ. Let us hear from you. Send us a letter. Send us an email. And put a comment down there, Amen. That way we'll we'll we, we can respond to you, and you know we can come closer. Uh, it's, it's always closer with communication. Well, again, this my name is Reverend Doctor Michael L. Martin. If I didn't say it earlier, Amen. I'm the pastor here at Camp Hope AME Church. We're located one one four Camp Hope Church Road, Macon, Georgia three one. 211. We pray that if you're in town, come visit us. We have Sunday school, amen, or church school at eight o'clock. 
Uh, we have service at nine and we're out of there by 10, 15, maybe 10, 30. Amen. Even if you want to come visit and go to your own church, we sort of give you that time and that, and that, that moment in there. But again, thank you for tuning in and see you next time.